Glory be to the Father, and to the Son, and to the Holy Spirit, now and forever. Amen. Lord Jesus, make us worthy to celebrate the exaltation of your glorious cross with sacred hymns and psalms. When you appear on the last day, and the sign of your cross will shine brighter than the sun, gather us before you and surround us with your eternal light, that we may raise glory and thanks to you, to your Father, and to your Holy Spirit forever. Amen. Peace be with the Church and her children. Let us raise glory, honor, and praise to the Savior who made the wood of his cross a strong fortress for his flock and established it as a sign of the covenant for the salvation of his inheritance. By his cross he exalted his church and gave joy to all people who believed in it. To the good one be glory and honor on this feast and all the days of our lives and forever. O oh Christ, our God, by your precious cross, you have given us perfect salvation and made us worthy to celebrate this feast with hymns of praise proclaiming. Blessed are you, O wood of the holy cross, for you erased Adam's curse and restored his banished children to their inheritance. Blessed are you, O holy cross, for you united heavenly and earthly beings. Blessed are you, O holy cross, for you fulfilled the words of the prophets, enlightened the apostles in their preaching, and crowned the martyrs for their faith, and honor the confessors for their loyalty. Now, O Christ, our Savior, we ask you with the fragrance of this incense to make the celebration of the feast of the exaltation of your holy cross a sign of security and peace. By your cross, exalt your holy church, guide her shepherds, adorn her priests with virtue, purify her deacons, help the elderly, educate children, direct the young, protect orphans, care for widows, and grant rest in your dwellings of light to our brothers and sisters who have died hoping in you. May we find refuge in the shadow of your holy cross on the great day of your second coming, that we may raise glory and thanks to you, to your Father, and to your Holy Spirit forever. Thank 
Jesus Christ, our Lord, accept these prayers and the fragrance of the incense that we have offered on the feast of the exaltation of your holy cross. May its sign always be visible before our eyes to strengthen us, that we may walk with you toward death and then stand at your right hand to celebrate the feast of your eternal victory. We glorify you, your Father, and your Holy Spirit forever. Kadishat Reading from the letter of St. Paul to the Philippians. Glory to the Lord of Paul and the Apostles. May the mercy of God descend upon the reader, the listeners, and upon this parish and to children forever. Brothers and sisters, join with others in being imitators of me and observe those who thus conduct themselves according to the model you have in us. For many, as I have often told you, and now tell you even in tears, conduct themselves as enemies of the cross of Christ. The end, their end, is destruction. 
Their God is their stomach. Their glory is in their shame. Their minds are occupied with earthly things, but our citizenship is in heaven. And from it, we also await a savior, the Lord Jesus Christ. He will change our lowly body to conform with his glorified body by the power that enables him also to bring all things into subjection to himself. Therefore, my brothers and sisters, for whom I love and long for, my joy and crown, in this way, stand firm in the Lord, my beloved. Praise be to God always. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. The message about the cross is foolishness for those who are perishing. But to us are being saved. Before the proclamation of the gospel of our Savior, announcing life for our souls, we offer this incense and ask for your mercy, O Lord. Peace be with you. From the Gospel of our Lord Jesus Christ, according to St. Matthew, who proclaimed life to the world, let us listen to the proclamation of life and salvation for our souls. You may silent the listeners, for the Holy Gospel is about to be proclaimed to you, listening in glory and thanks to the word of the living God. The Lord Jesus says, if anyone says to you then, look, here is the Messiah, or there he is, do not believe it. For false prophets, false messiahs and false prophets shall arise, and they shall perform signs and wonders so great as to the deceive, if it were possible, even the elect. Behold, I have told it to you beforehand, so if they say to you, he is in the desert, do not go out there. If they say, he is in the inner rooms, do not believe it. For just as lightning comes from the east and is seen as far as the west, so shall the coming of the Son of Man be. And wherever the corpse is, there the vultures shall gather. Immediately after the tribulation of those days, the sun shall be darkened, and the moon shall not give its light, and the stars shall fall from the sky, and the powers of the heavens shall be shaken. And then the sign of the Son of Man shall appear in heaven, and all the tribes and nations of the earth shall mourn and they shall look upon the Son of Man coming upon the clouds of heaven with great power and with great glory. And he shall send out his angels with a trumpet blast, and they shall gather his elect from the four winds, from one end of the heavens to the other. This is the truth, peace be with you.
Then if anyone says to you, Behold, here is the Christ, or there he is, do not believe it. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit, amen. So last week, someone said, these sermons are so dark, which was a good sign because it meant the person was not asleep during the sermons, at least heard what had to be said. But of course, what we have for the six weeks at the end of the liturgical year is the end of the world. That's the season of the Holy Cross. That's its meaning, the end of time, the deception that comes to us, the darkness of judgment and the anticipation of this. But the important thing for us to remember when we looked over it, so these last three weeks, we've already seen the question of the redemption of time on the first week following immediately the Holy Cross. The chronological time, chronos, kairos, this redemption of time that God gives us, that's part of the vision of the end of the world. St. Paul will say in his letters, time is short. Redeem the time because the days are evil. It's only a shortness. We don't know how long we're going to last. So use this day well, the redemption of time. And then last week we considered the transition from the earth to the kingdom. This transition, this elevation ultimately, that God has created all things in order to bring them back to him. But because human beings are free, they can set opposition. And hence you come to the third week of our Lord's teaching from the Gospel of St. Matthew, and it's on that opposition which is placed freely by choice, which is why if you go back and read the Gospels and you see continually in our Lord's parables and his teaching, so many times he finishes by saying, in fact, we're told he doesn't say it, we're told he cries out, let those who have ears to hear, let them hear. So you can imagine the people all around in our Lord's insistence. St. John in the book of Revelation, the letters to the seven churches of Asia, but each letter ends by saying, let those who have ears to hear, hear what the Spirit is saying. And of course, the book of Revelation is about that end time. So our Lord is always talking about be watchful, pray. When St. Peter falls asleep on the night of our Lord's passion of his arrest, our Lord comes back to him during three hours, and each time he finds them, the apostles laying there on the ground drooling, sleeping. And finally, in the last hour, he comes and says, you know, sleep now, because the son of iniquity has arrived. The time has come now for the hour of darkness. But before those three hours, our Lord says to the three, Peter, James, and John, he says, pray. Because the spirit is willing, but the flesh is weak. Our human nature, what we are as human beings, is weak. It's not bad, it's not evil, it's not demonic. It's just weak. And so we will tend to follow the path of least resistance and just do what everybody else does. Because it's the easiest thing to do. Which is why in the parables also our Lord is always finishing by saying, be watchful, therefore, because you do not know the hour or the day. And so in this third week, what our Lord is doing is he's saying, beware of deception. Now he's pointing towards the end of time. But all the parables have always said, you must live your life in a way to be awake, be conscious. You are my disciples, you are children of the light. By the definition of children of the light means you live in radiance, you see clearly because the light shines not only with you but the illumination of the faith, but you yourselves become lamps unto others. That's the children of the light. But he's saying be careful because the deception will be so dark that everyone will be taken in even the elect, if that were possible. A few lines before this in this gospel today, it's not quoted today, but our Lord says, if the days, if these days not be shortened, all flesh will be destroyed. But for the sake of the elect, those days will be limited. 
And so what our Lord is saying is you are capable as the children of the light to confront anti-Christ. This is what he's talking, the false messiahs, the false Christs, the false prophets. He speaks about the spirit of antichrist. Now, we've had too many television shows and movies about the antichrist, which is for the most part a bunch of hooey. They're stupid, and so let's talk a little bit about what our Lord is speaking about in this opposition. That's what all that antichrist means. It's opposition to the Christ, anti Christos. It's the opposition to the Messiah. And we know through the writings, our Lord just speaks about that opposition, the false messiahs, the false Christ, the false prophets, false teachers. But St. John and St. Paul in their writings specify further. Antichrist is not a generic idea. St. John in his writings, in his letters, he says, that the Antichrist is already in the world. He speaks in the plural of Antichrists. That these spirits of opposition, these false teachers that our Lord talks about, they begin in the very first generation of the gospel. And our Lord speaks of it here in this gospel, and St. John speaks about the fact that Antichrist is already in the world. So it's a spirit, individual teachings, that are in opposition to the Christ. St. John speaks about dissolving Jesus, dissolving the Lord. This idea of taking apart the doctrine, the revelation of the Messiah. But in St. Paul's writing, he speaks about the individual person. This is the Hollywood obsession, who the Antichrist is going to be. And there will be a historical man. St. John talking about Antichrist in the plural is talking about attitudes false teachings, false teachers. But, our, but St. Paul says this will all come to a culmination, to an apogee, a full climax, which will indicate the coming of our Lord. Read the gospel again that we have today's mass in the bulletin. Our Lord doesn't speak about, when he talks about the days of tribulation, it's not about the sun going dark and the moon turning the blood and the powers of the heavens being shaken. That's what follows after. Before that, he says, after those days of tribulation, the sun will darken, the moon will turn to blood. You know, the things that Hollywood thinks about the apocalypse of being, our Lord doesn't call that the tribulation. He calls the deception of Antichrist and the deception of even the children of light and even the elect, the predestined, if it were possible. He doesn't say the Christians aren't going to fall. He says the elect, and that's what's distinct. Baptism isn't necessarily going to save us. Baptism begins a life, but that life only becomes salvific in the end when we are awake, when the ears that we have have heard and we have been vigilant and prayerful, which is why our Lord doesn't say, my church will not be deceived. He says that the elect will not be deceived. We know historically that, for example, in the persecutions of Diocletian at the end of the 200s, so it lasted from 285 up until 313. So for almost a 20-year period, they were exterminating by the thousands Christians all around the Mediterranean basin. And Egypt gave per capita so many martyrs during that persecution, they have an entire calendar the Christian calendar of Egypt, they call it the year of the martyrs. We use AD for the year of the Lord. They use AM for the year of the martyrs. And it begins in the year 285, the year that Diocletian became emperor. They date it from the beginning of the extermination of so many thousands of their people. But we know in that historical moment that's where you get the famous martyrs of St. Agatha, St. Agnes. They come out of that persecution. But we know histor the historians estimate that in fact the majority of Catholics collapsed in front of the civil authorities, capitulated, offered sacrifices to the gods, did whatever the government wanted, apostatized from the faith, which is tragic. 
and it caused a huge turmoil for the next 70 years after the church because you're like, what do we do with people who have repudiated their baptism? You can't baptize them again. And it became this huge controversy, caused a schism, caused devastation within the church for generations to come after because we had the majority of the Catholics collapse in that 20 year period. It's sobering to think about. And when we think about, on average, Bishop Dealey, when he was here at Maundy Thursday, he was talking about, for the Latins, there's like one in four Catholics who practices their faith, actually, in Maine. It's not a great statistic. And no one's persecuting us. No one's making it hard. We just, the flesh is weak, even if the spirit is willing. But you'll notice that Peter louses up that whole night cuts off an ear, flails around, does all these things. But in the end, maybe his intention, he loved our Lord, but in the end, he still screwed up the entire night, screwed up the entire next day also. And so this is why our Lord says, be vigilant, watchful, be awake. And so when St. John talks about the spirit of the Antichrist and he talks about it in these plurality, He's talking about basically three different things. One, the dissolution, the dissolving of Christ. What the heck is this supposed to mean in the scriptures? It's the dissolution of what our Lord has taught. This is the word that we use, heresy, which again becomes a strange word that everyone kind of freaks out over. The word only means choice in Greek. It's the cafeteria Catholic who comes in, well, I like that, oh, I like that, forget about that. That's nice, I, li I like Christmas. Put that on my tray, uh, and they pick. The catechism as the authentic integrity of the teaching of the church, of our Lord, oh. It's a rejection of the authority of our Lord in his teaching. It's a rejection of the integrity of the faith. That's why we call it heresy. I keep the name Christian and I pick and choose what I actually want to hold on to. That's the, that's the fundamental definition of heresy. And that is antichrist. It stands in opposition to the Messiah's integrity of teaching, his wholeness of teaching. The second, in a sense, goes even further because it's just the question of what we now call secularism. There's only this world. That's it. We're born into this world, we die and we disappear. Take my ashes, dump them in the Kennebec, whatever. This world is all that exists. That's why we call it secularism. Seculum in Latin means the world, this age. That's all there is. That is also when St. Paul talks about it and when our Lord and St. Augustine and the fathers of the church, it is that opposition to Christ because it's to say that it's only this world and the transcendent kingdom that has entered into this world by death and resurrection of the Messiah is rejected. Christianity has nothing to do with this world. You guys get you know, cheap thrills on Sunday to go to church, grow good for you. We don't need it. That's secularism, and it stands in opposition to the revelation of the Messiah. So it is also antichrist. It's one of the plurals that St. John will be speaking about. Because the kingdom is something which enters into this world. It is not imposed. No one is going to be forced into salvation. It has to be reciprocated, a friendship of love back and forth. And the last of the spirits that St. John will talk about is the worldliness. In fact, St. Paul does today. It's why this letter to the Philippians was chosen. When he writes and he says to you, I've told you about these people in the parish of, of, of Philippi, and I tell you again, but now I'm weeping as I write this letter. These are bad Christians. Their God is their belly. They worry about their foods, where the restaurant they're going to go to. And he says, and they glory in their shame. The objective things which they do, which are disordered, are their glory. This is what St. Paul, that's why it's chosen by the church to go with this gospel. And so what that instance then is what St. Paul is talking about is that they know better or they should know better. And they glory in what is objectively something destructive to them. It's the, how do you get to that point? You only get to that point when you do not see the revelation of Christ as being whole and entire and offered to me for my healing, but as something which is pleasant on occasion that I work into my life when it's convenient. 
that is also antichrist. The classic word that we use for it is worldliness. It's the Christian who you keeps the name still, but is still primarily the worldling that likes religion on occasion. And our Lord is what he says, the flesh is weak. So these are the multiplicity of the opposition of deception. But as we mention, as we pray for illumination, as we pray for the strength of will, our Lord says, but there is also the Antichrist. This will come to a culmination in one historical man. And it will be a man. It will not be a demon or a fallen angel or any other goofy thing that comes out of television. It will be a man and he will be born in the blood and the stock of Israel. Because the only people for whom the word Christ or Messiah means anything are for modern day Jews and for Christians. And it is clear from the writings of St. Paul, what seems very clear, is that man born into the world, it's important to remember, he's not going to be some kind of, you know, heavy breathing, you know, mutilated little creature in the corner. This is going to be a man who is going to be brilliant, who is going to be beautiful, and is going to have all kinds of wonderful ideas about getting rid of inequality, poverty in the world. He's going to say all the right things that the world wants. Otherwise, why do you think he's deceptive? And it seems from the writing of St. Paul that this man will actually be received by many in Israel, many of the Jews, as the Christ for that period of a few years that St. John talks about in the Acropolis. This is what our Lord is talking about of the great moment of deception. And if Christians collapse so easily when no one's doing anything to us, maybe smothering us with marshmallows, but that's about it. What happens when you have the brilliant figure of world in standing in front of us? This is what our Lord is saying. This is the tribulation of those days. This is to try all individuals mentally in their will and in their strength. And so what our Lord is saying here in all of this, to be awake, is that what we do is we pray for that illumination of the faith to always enter more deeply into us. And from that, to have the strength of the will to embrace that gospel and that faith, which is what leads us to the clarity of our conviction, why we are convinced of the gospel. Without that, we get sucked down the tubes. No ifs, ands, or buts. The clarity of the conviction for us to be able to embrace the gospel as the children of light. And that's why our Lord says clearly, if people are telling you, you there's a new redemption coming, there's this Christ here, this Messiah, do not believe it. The redemption is here in the person of Jesus of Nazareth. And that's what our Lord insists on. That's what our Lord wants. They are sobering considerations. But because the light of the gospel is offered to us, we have solid hope and the possibility of iron-willed conviction if we respond to that grace of the gospel. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit, amen.
believe in one God. Said what my dear head are loco, while what I love for the father for you. I am still but I would talk, I would advise of what's good at fire flow, what for the Almighty Lord in God, you accepted the offerings of our ancestors. Now we accept these offerings that your children have brought to you out of their love for you and for your holy name. Shower your spiritual blessings upon them and in place of their earthly gifts, grant them life and your imperishable kingdom. Amen. As we remember our Lord God and Savior Jesus Christ and his plan of salvation for us, we recall upon this offering all those who have pleased God from Adam to this day, especially Mary, the Blessed Mother of God, St. Joseph, her spouse, St. Mary, St. Jude, and St. Kiriakos. Remember, O God, the children of the Holy Church, our fathers and mothers and our brothers and sisters, both the living and the departed, especially those for whom the sacrifice is offered for the repose of Carolyn, Nail them. Remember also all those who share with us today in this offering.
Side into the Holy Spirit now and forever. Amen. Lord God, Almighty Father, you are true and holy love. May we be bound by your divine love and find joy in it all the days of our lives. Make us worthy to give one another the greeting of peace with the holy kiss, that through Jesus Christ our Lord we may be your radiant and blameless flock. We glorify and honor you, your only Son, and your Holy Spirit, now and forever. Amen. Peace to your holy altar of God. Peace to the holy mysteries placed upon you. Peace to you, O minister of God. Peace to you, O server of the Holy Spirit. Let each one of us give a greeting of peace to his neighbor with love and faith, which is pleasing to the Lord. before you and ask that you grant us in your mercy the riches of your grace and kindness. May your compassion and assistance sustain us all the days of our lives through the grace of your only Son and his love for all people. We glorify and honor you, your only Son and your Holy Spirit, now and forever. Holy God and Father, you sent your only Son to save us, for we are weak and poor. When we had gone astray, he brought us back to your spiritual fold by his royal blood. Through your grace and the favor of your only Son, we implore you to accept this bloodless sacrifice from our sinful hands, and through it to forgive our sins. We glorify and honor you, your only Son, and your Holy Spirit, now and forever. Amen. The love of God the Father and the grace of the only begotten Son and the communion and indwelling of the Holy Spirit be with you, my brothers and sisters, forever. Let us lift up our thoughts, our minds, and our hearts. We lift them up to the Lord. Let us give thanks to the Lord with reverence and worship him with humility. It is right and just. Truly glory, thanks, praise, and honor are yours, O God the Father, maker of all creation, with your only begotten Son and your living Holy Spirit. The angels, archangels, and all the heavenly hosts bless and praise you. They cry out and they proclaim.
holy, holy, holy are you, God, the Father Almighty, with your only Son and your Holy Spirit. When we had strayed from you by transgressing your law, you sent your only Son into the world for our salvation. By his saving passion, he restored us to our original inheritance, and he gave us life by his divine blood. Whenever you observe these commandments, you proclaim my death and resurrection until I come again. We remember your death, O Lord. We profess your resurrection. We await your second coming. We implore your mercy and compassion. We ask for the forgiveness of sins. May your mercy rest upon us. Lord Jesus Christ, we remember your plan of salvation for us, your conception, birth, and baptism, your saving passion, and life-giving death, your burial, your glorious resurrection, and ascension into heaven, your sitting at the right hand of God the Father, and your royal second coming when you will judge all people and reward them according to their deeds. Now we ask you, at that fearful hour, have compassion on us and have mercy on us in your kindness and forgive our sins in your mercy. For this your church implores you and through you and with you implores your Father, saying, Have mercy on us, Almighty Father, have mercy on us. O Lord, as we, your sinful children, receive your graces, we thank you for them and because of them. upon this offering for our sanctification. Let us stand with reverence as we pray. Manin morio, manin morio, manin morio, nite modro ho chayu kadisho, o nachen alainu al korbono ho no. By his descent he may make this bread the body of Christ our God. Amen. And make the mixture in this chalice the blood of Christ our God. Amen. May these 
these holy mysteries be for the forgiveness of sins, the pardon of faults, the upper, uh, honor, upbuilding, and strengthening of your holy church, and the protection of her children from all sin. And may these holy mysteries allow us to stand with confidence before your awesome throne, that we may raise glory to you, to your only Son, and to your Holy Spirit, now and forever. O Lord, exalt your holy church, establish it throughout the world. Protect her shepherds of the true faith in peace and security all the days of their lives, especially Francis, the Pope of Rome, Bashara Peter, our Patriarch of Antioch, Gregory John, our Bishop, and all the bishops, pious priests, pure deacons, and all who serve your holy altar. We pray to you, O Lord. Lord, have mercy. Remember, O Lord, all those who call upon your holy name. Bless those who are near and bring back those who are far. Visit the sick and strengthen the weak. Release captives and assist the oppressed. Bring back those who have strayed that they may live in your fear and reward those who have brought offerings to your holy church. We pray to you, O Lord. Lord, have mercy. Remember, O Lord, our civil leaders and all the children of your holy church. Grant them security and peace and keep domestic and foreign conflicts far from them so they may live in tranquility. Protect them by the sign of your living and victorious cross. Rescue the persecuted and displaced of your flock and be a refuge for strangers and a companion to travelers. Grant your eternal reward to monks and those who live solitary lives and to hermits who live on mountaintops and in the caves of the earth. We pray to you, O Lord. Remember, O Lord, upon this altar and upon your heavenly or holy altar, the holy and ever Virgin Mary, Mother of God, the prophets, apostles, martyrs, confessors, and evangelists, John the Baptist, the forerunner, Stephen, the archdeacon and first martyr, Saint Joseph, Saint Jude, Saint Marin, Saint Kyriakos, and all the saints. May we join in their ranks and share in their joyful feast. We pray to you, O Lord. Remember, O Lord, the faithful teachers who have gone to their rest in the true faith, especially Peter, Paul, Mark, Clement, Ignatius, Dionysus, Julius, and all those who endured suffering and persecution for the strengthening of your holy church. Remember also who serve all those who serve your holy altar and forgive their sins, that they may reach your joyful dwelling. We pray to you, O Lord. Lord, have mercy. Remember, O Lord, all those who have left this world and have gone to you. Lead them to your joyful dwellings and blot out all their sins. Through our Lord God and Savior, Jesus Christ, who is without sin, we hope to find mercy and forgiveness for our sins and for theirs. Grant rest, O Lord, to the departed. Grant us pardon, O God, and forgive us and the departed, so that your blessed name may be glorified in us and in all things. With the name of our Lord Jesus Christ and of your living Holy Spirit, now and forever. Wow. 
the pleasing oblation who offered yourself for us. You are the forgiving sacrifice who offered yourself to your Father. You are the high priest who offered yourself as the Lamb. Through your mercy, may our prayer rise like incense, which we offer to your Father through you. To you be glory forever. O oh God the Father, you are merciful and compassion. You have sanctified this divine service and have perfected it in your good pleasure by the grace of your only Son and by the descent of your Holy Spirit. Sanctify us now that we may be renewed as your spiritual children so that with pure hearts and enlightened souls we will call upon you, O glorious Father and lover of all people, praying, Our, Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For the kingdom, the power, and the glory are yours, now and forever. Deliver us, O Lord, from every temptation of soul and body, and crush our enemy, the evil one. Grant us your mercy through Christ Jesus our Lord, for you are blessed and glorified with him and with your Holy Spirit now and forever. Amen. Peace be with you. And with your spirit. Let us bow our heads before the God of mercy, before his forgiving altar, and before the body and blood of our Savior, who gives life to those who partake of him and receive the blessing from the Lord. O Lord, look upon us, your inheritance, who bow before you, and guide our steps on your right path. Make us worthy to share in this sacrifice, and may it sanctify the souls and bodies of those who receive it, through Christ Jesus our Lord. We glorify and honor you, your only Son, and your Holy Spirit, now and forever. Amen. The grace of the Most Holy Trinity, eternal and consubstantial, be with you, my brothers and sisters, forever. Let each one of us look to God with reverence and humility and ask him for mercy and compassion. Holy gifts for the holy with perfection, purity, and sanctity. One, one holy, holy Father, Father, one Holy Son, one Holy Spirit, blessed be the name of the Lord, for he is one in heaven and on earth. To him be glory forever. Make us worthy, O Lord God, so that our bodies may be sanctified by your holy body, and our souls purified by your forgiving blood. May our communion be for the forgiveness of our sins and for new life. O Lord our God, to you be glory forever. the land.
O oh God the Father, how can we who are unworthy thank you for your grace? For you have given us this divine gift and have made us worthy to share in the body and blood of your only begotten Son who saved us. Through him and with him, glory and honor are due to you and to your Holy Spirit now and forever. Peace be with you. Jesus Christ, our Lord and God, you are worshipped and you are holy. 
Bless and forgive the priests who are the stewards of your people and of your holy church. Forgive the servers of your divine mysteries and all the faithful who have shared in this sacrifice. Care for orphans, help widows, assist the poor and the distressed, satisfy the hungry, and protect all who call upon your holy name in every place. May your name be glorified with that of your Father and your Holy Spirit, who is good, life-giving, and consubstantial with you now and forever. So I have to take a moment, because yesterday's Hoffley was so stunningly beautiful, and I think it exceeded all of our expectations. Plus, God certainly was in collaboration with us. It didn't rain until after the cleanup. And once the day was done and everyone came out absolutely exhausted from the basement of the church, there was a stunning rainbow at the top. So God himself congratulated you. But I cannot let that beautiful day go by without thanking so many of you, of course, that have been involved with it. But especially to Ruth and to Lenore, who slaved away for six months, sometimes in incredulity that this is never going to work. And also for the feats of virtuosity by Bodhi. Who knew that she could not only make the highly complimented kibbe, not only manage the whole serving line and the kitchen, but run from the kitchen and enliven the whole Maluf band by dancing at the same time, jingling her belted coin, and then rushing back into the kitchen. It was such a magnificent feat of virtuosity that I spilled my tabbouleh all down the front of my cassock. <laughs> so thank you to one and all for such a magnificent day yesterday. You deserve all around the congratulations, and we all owe you great thanks for all that you did. So may God bless you all. Go in peace, my beloved brothers and sisters, with the nourishment and blessings you have received from the forgiving altar of the Lord. May the blessing of the Most Holy Trinity accompany you, the Father, and the Son, and the Holy Spirit, the one God, to whom be glory forever. <clears throat>